States. There is no parallel to the economic bondage in which cotton holds the South. Victims of its one-top system are the five and a half million white folk, three million Negroes, tenant farmers, sharecroppers, laborers, who own no land themselves, farm 60% of the South's 27 million acres of cotton. Victims, too, and completely dependent on the cotton belt's one source of income, are the planter landlords. I know times are hard, and I know conditions are far from perfect. But it's the system that's all wrong. It's been handed down to us through generations. It can't be corrected overnight. You don't think I'm getting rich, do you? No, sir. surplus of 13 million bales, a whole year's crop piled up unsold in southern warehouses. Then a new deal stepped in, ordered every third row of the new crop plowed under. The next year increased its program to cut 40% of all cotton acreage. 990,000 men and women were let off the land. Vast sums were paid out in benefits. But some of the sharecroppers failed to receive their part of the government's benefit checks and their protests reverberate in Washington's Department of Agriculture, where three officials are fired, among them Councilor Gardner Jackson of the AAA. Well, one of the reasons we were fired is because Jerome Frank, Lee Tuckman, and some of the rest of us tried to see to it that these sharecroppers got something approaching a square deal. What percentage of the sharecroppers do you figure got gypped? Well, in darn near half the cases, maybe more, the sharecroppers didn't get a nickel of the benefit payments. The landlords pocketed them all. But actually, back of it is politics. It would be political suicide to go against the planters. They're the Democrats who have the real power in the cotton south. Echoing across Arkansas are the first rumblings of revolt in the Southland. That's poor you've been sharecropping all your life, and you ain't got a thing to show for it. We can't live on 75 cents a day. I'd like for any plant in the state to show me where we can. Let's, let's get together. Let's get together. And let's build the Southern Tennis Farmers Union and make a country worthwhile to live in. Headquarters of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union are set up in Memphis, just across the Mississippi River from the troubled region. As membership swells to five to ten to twenty-five thousand, the cotton farmers demand of the planters written contracts, wages of a dollar and a half for a ten-hour day, and recognition of their right to organize. Soon, many a country road is peopled with families wandering aimlessly. Some homeless because of curtailed production, others evicted by planters for joining in union activity. Then the union calls its members to unite for the cotton field's first strike. Let them throw us in jail if they want to. We'll fill every jail in Arkansas. But get off the fields and stay off until the bosses give in. Prospect of ruined crops, the Arkansas planters close ranks. Well, if they ain't got sense enough to know that this union business is just going to make things worse, we got to teach them. Word of 
the Blags and Williams investigating expedition from Tennessee had already reached planters in the little Arkansas town of Earl. What do you men want? All right, brother. Get going. Run on down the highway. Next day, the violent end of the Blags and Williams attempted investigation brings into sharp focus for the entire nation eastern Arkansas's planter copper trouble. From Arkansas's capital at Little Rock, Governor Marion Buttel speaks out in defense of the planters. I deny that there's any tyranny in Arkansas. And I defy any one of these outside agitators to prove any one of their malicious falsehood. Observers agree with Arkansas's governor that it is not the planter who is at fault in the Southland, but the one crop system which has both planter and cropper in peonage. Gone are the days when U.S. cotton dominated the world's supply, for foreign countries stepped up production and took U.S. markets, while U.S. planters were being forced to curtail their crops. Gone, too, are King Cotton's traditional boundaries, where southern wealth was born. Today, one-third of all U.S. cotton grows in the new, fertile stretches of Texas and Oklahoma, where large-scale industrialized farming can produce cotton 40% cheaper than in the Old South. It is plain today that planter and sharecropper alike are the economic slaves of the Old South's one crop system. That only basic change can restore the one-time peace and prosperity of the kingdom of cotton. Time marches on.